Today's episode is sponsored by Squarespace. All right, what it do, my analog burdens of society. Today we're back on our bullshit because I am once again back out of content. Let's take a look at some movies and TV that feature the use of a film camera, which uh, if you're anything like me, you see on screen and then immediately turn around and Google for no reason whatsoever, which ultimately rips you out of the movie completely. Though to be fair, some movies are begging to be completely disassociated from. Sometimes the prop department gets the time period correct, and sometimes even the sound department gets the shutter slap sound effect correct too. But you always know at least one thing for sure, your boy Jason's gonna tear them apart if they get it wrong. The same way I'm sure the comment section of this video will tear my ass apart if I get something wrong. Let's start here with Godzilla minus one. Why the f does he walk like a toddler with a loaded up diaper? Okay, so there's this um, brief scene here where this guy uses a film camera to take a picture of this woman and then it's never brought up again for the rest of the movie. So what was the point of showing it? F if I know. It's kind of hard to tell exactly what camera he's using because we never get really a great look at it, but I think we can gleam a few things from context clues. This movie takes place around 1945 and it's clearly a rangefinder style camera. I guess I would surmise that it's probably an early Canon rangefinder which were made kind of close to that time period. I thought at first it might be the Canon 4 but after looking at it maybe not actually. No. The top plate doesn't quite line up. This actually could be a Leica. In fact I think it is. The Leica 3F and was that the 3B have a very similar look on the top plate and the lens is probably a collapsible 50 mil of some kind. It might be the five centimeter 3.5 Elmar, although the infinity lock is on a different side in the movie. <laughs> hmm. Hi. That might actually be kind of what it looks like through the viewfinder. You don't see a rangefinder patch in the viewfinder there because in the early days it was a separated system. So, you know, you had to frame up with one window and then uh, focus through the rangefinder patch with a different window and then go back to the framed up window, something like that. It's not exactly the fastest or easiest way to do it, right? I think we're all pretty happy they eventually figured out how to integrate the two. However, you wouldn't really see this sort of like, I don't know, depth of field effect through the viewfinder like that. With these optical viewfinders on these cameras, everything's in focus, the foreground, background, whatever. The viewfinder itself isn't looking through the camera's lens. Uh, hi. Hmm. I don't know about that shutter sound. That sounds more like a, like a slide projector advancing or something like that to me. I've never used one of these old cameras personally, but I imagine it would sound more like this. Uh, hi. A potential, uh, you know, gotcha bitch moment here. Our boy never advances the film after he takes the photo, nor does he advance the film before he takes the photo. There's a lot of discussion in the film community about I guess which methodology is better, but ultimately you're either one or the other and this guy does neither. So whoops, the film advances this knob here. You turn it like a dial until the next frame is lined up. Also these uh, early rangefinders did not have light meters built into them and we never see our guy light meter ever. So either he's a beast at the sunny 16 rule or I don't know, maybe he's just like F it, let it fly. Life is kind of bullshit anyway. A giant angry lizard comes by every once in a while to curb stomp your shit into oblivion so honestly who cares dog what are you doing grab your fucking camera you'd rather take pictures of your homies than like a huge fight between the japanese navy and a fucking dinosaur Twisters. What is she taking a picture of? Okay, so yeah, if you weren't distracted the whole movie by how hot Glenn Powell is, you may have noticed that our certified normal person here shoots with a Nikon F2. At least I'm pretty sure it's a Nikon F2, just based on the shape of the prism up top. The Nikon F2 is actually a really good choice of film camera for this movie. Nikon F2s are famously super durable and rugged. A perfect choice for somebody who chases down fucking tornadoes. I'd like to think that the production and the writing team made that an intentional choice. I don't know. 
I think it was probably more of an aesthetic choice. I mean, those cameras look damn cool, uh, especially the uh, titanium versions. Wink. Oh, wait. Wasn't there something in the first movie about how they were shooting a... It was like a Nikon F3, I think. Oh, yeah. Maybe it's a nod to that. If it is, good job. I don't know what lens she's using. We never really get a great look at it. It's probably a 50, you know, to be honest. If all she does is take pictures of like cool storm clouds and if they really wanted to be over the top photo nerdy in this movie, they'd probably have her shooting black and white film with a dense ass orange filter over the lens to cut through some of that atmospheric haze and create some contrast in the blue clouds. Those photos would probably look absolutely sick. If they ever get around to making Twisters 3, even twistier, let me know. I'll consult on it for free. Uh, as long as Glenn Powell's around. Civil War. There will definitely be spoilers in this section for sure. I actually really like this movie. Probably because I could relate to the characters a little bit. But instead of war and explosions, for me it's, you know, abandoned buildings and crackheads. This whole movie is kind of about like this fictional civil war that's going on in the United States and everything is just kind of sh**. The movie follows these two uh, frontline photographers that are kind of just documenting it all. And, you know, surprisingly, the photography aspect of this movie is pretty accurate sometimes. Mary Jane here plays uh, Lee, who's a famous war photographer with kind of a strange setup of gear, to be honest. I don't really know how she came to that conclusion, but whatever. It's a Sony of some kind. They all look the same, so I don't really know, much less care. And obviously neither did Sony because they clearly didn't want to pay for product placement. And of course on it, it's got a Leica M lens. It's the Sumicron 35mm f2 and it's attached to the Sony, not natively, but through an adapter. The adapter is the, I think it's the TT Artisans adapter. It's got that logo up top. I find it, it kind of interesting that they have her using a manual lens with the Sony. I mean, in some of these scenes, she's literally running and gunning, probably relying on like zone focus to take her photos. I would think using an autofocus lens would be beneficial here. It would get your mind off like extraneous things like where to pull focus and free up some space in your head to think about how I'm going to stay alive in an active shootout. The other character that Lee is more or less uh, unwillingly mentoring is this young photographer played by not Ripley, who only shoots film in this like old Nikon that I guess she got from her dad. FE2s. You don't see them around much. Yeah. They're my dad's cameras, actually. He's sitting on his farm in Missouri pretending like none of this is happening. Yeah, so the Nikon FE2 is a really good choice. It's one of those cameras that has kind of just withstood the test of time, you know? The writers obviously did some amount of research into this and good on them for that. If her Missouri farmer dad owned like a Leica MP titanium or something like that and then handed it down to her, I'd be rolling my fucking shit into my eyes. That sounds like an accurate shutter slap in advance, yeah. You can kind of barely see it in some shots, but Jesse is using a Nikkor 24mm 2.8 lens on at least one of her FE2s. The other lens I don't really recognize, it's some sort of variable zoom, and uh, I don't think she ever uses it in the movie. I do like that we have a character shooting film in this movie. It creates an interesting dichotomy between, you know, her and Lee. Obviously, shooting film was done for many years and, you know, many conflicts before digital came around, but I have to ask this yet again, is this really the best choice? Don't get me wrong, I love film, obviously, but if you can't get any gas, electricity, cell service, or like any commodities in this world, and people are blowing it up left and right, realistically, what is the likelihood that you're going to be able to get, you know, developing chemicals on a regular basis, much less manufactured film itself? I mean, shit, we're not even in a civil war and Kodak can barely keep up. <clears throat> developing eggs on the road. Yeah, I got myself a pretty neat travel kit. Want to know the secret of getting the developer just right? Hmm. Body temperature. Smart. Thank you. I don't know if the body temperature developing thing is true. I guess I always kind of thought most black and white developer needed to be at a cooler temperature than I guess what body temperature would be. Uh, what she said actually might be true for color C41 chemicals, but I'm not really sure. And we never see her shoot color, so. Hey, these are dry. Should we check them out? Uh, girl, have some self-respect. You have to use gloves when you're handling your negatives. Still need a phone even though you can't get a signal. So yeah, that's the Lomography smartphone scanner. It's a pretty cool little device that gives you results pretty instantly without the need of like a copy stand or an extravagant scanning setup. I've never actually seen anyone use one, but good on them. Perfect if you're a war photographer, I suppose. Just like, exposure's all wrong. Let's keep looking. 
I figure the strike rate for keepers is 30 to one. Not if you're me, girl. That number is much lower. Okay. I don't know what film stock she's shooting here at the end of the movie, but it must be one of those mythical 500 frame rolls that don't actually exist because we never see her reload her camera once. Earlier in the film, she was uh, shooting Kodak T-Max 400, I believe based on the key code info. And that might be kind of passable for some of the stuff here at night, especially with a 2.8 lens. Though admittedly, when they do go into the, the White House, it might be a bit of a stretch. The light is very dim. I mean, I guess you can push T-Max 400, but that doesn't actually give you more light. Hmm. Okay. I, I don't know about that. It seems like it would not be very easy to pop off five frames in a split second with a manual winding film camera. Maybe. I don't know. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why you always use a UV filter on your lens. Rocky Horror Picture Show. You might not remember this because there's a lot of other crazy shit that happens in this movie, but the opening scene has a, a film photographer in it, a wedding photographer actually. You can tell he's a wedding photographer because he's got a huge camera and he's angry at his assistant. Anyway, we see him here with a uh, Mamiya press camera. I think it's the Super 23, the silver frame kind of gives it away. Yeah, that's definitely a Mamiya Super 23. It's a really cool rangefinder, heavy, I think. Heavier with whatever this flash is, for sure. That camera shoots a uh, humongous 6x9 image on medium format 120 film. There is also a 6x7 back, I believe, for that system. I'm not really sure which one Homeboy is using here. I'm not sure if this was ever really a popular wedding photography camera. I always thought it was the camera that people hauled in for like field reporting. The lens on here is the 100mm 3.5, so at least that makes sense. Because this camera works off of a leaf shutter in the lens, you can sync your flash to any shutter speed that's available, which I'm probably wrong, but I think on that camera it was 1 500th at its fastest. I've also seen some people modify these to shoot 4x5, which is just absolutely insane. Apparently some of these Mamiya Press lenses cover that format. You won't catch me doing it, but hey, whatever. Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Hi, Harry. I'm Colin Creevy. I'm in Gryffindor too. Okay, so we've probably all seen this movie by now, right? This little dipshit gets petrified for taking pictures of people when they aren't paying attention. It's basically street photography, except with real consequences. It is a little bit hard to tell what camera that is specifically, but the brick shape of it kind of gives it away. It's probably an old Argus box camera of some kind. The only one I know of is the Argus C3, which this one may or may not be. They're actually pretty cool cameras that are, you know, kind of affordable nowadays. They were pretty widely popular if I remember correctly too. I'm pretty old though. I think they were produced in like the 40s and 50s. I'd be surprised if they have light meters in them. These cameras are also little rangefinders. So if you pick one up, the rangefinders could be kind of out of alignment from, you know, years of use or not use probably or not. I don't know. I mean, they did make stuff to last back in the day. That's why your dad's garage beer fridge is going to outlive all of us. Um, it says here that the top shutter speed on these was one 300th of a second. So that's not great, but it's probably a non-issue if you're, you know, shooting Kodachrome all day. I don't know. It's a pretty cool looking camera. There's a good chance you can find one of these at your local thrift store for like 20 bucks. That's the only time I've ever seen them. I imagine this camera was chosen for stylistic purposes, but it could actually serve as like an interesting character development thing here. Like maybe the camera was handed down from his parents or something who apparently were lower income muggles. So that camera being there actually tracks quite well. I had to ask Monica about that one. I can't say I'm too deep into Harry Potter lore. More of a Twilight guy myself. Lost in Translation. Lost in Translation is definitely one of my all time favorite movies. If you've ever like studied abroad or been sent somewhere for work, you'd probably get it. Or, you know, if you're a film photographer, I guess. So in this movie, Scarlett Johansson's husband, who's played by Giovanni Rabisi, is a professional photographer and he's kind of portrayed as this like douche who's more interested in his art than her. So at least that part's accurate. But the fitting today, they, they had all these rock and roll clothes, but the, but, but, but the band wasn't tough at all. In this scene, he's rearranging his gear or some shit. 
I don't know. It's pretty clear what he's shooting. It's the Pentax 6-7. He's pretty bricked up, actually. It looks like he has several of them that he carries in one giant ass case that's probably heavy as shit. Okay, so I feel like we're gonna revisit the Pentax 6-7 every time we do this now. There are four uh, models in the Pentax 6-7 line. There's the original Pentax 6x7, there's the Pentax 6-7, there's the Pentax 6-7 mirror lockup version, and then there's the, the Pentax 6-7-2. Whew. Anyway, they're all huge and loud and they break often. And they can be used as weapons to scare off home invaders. But the one he's like fiddling with, the one he's holding, might actually be a Pentax 672 because it looks like it's got the built-in hand grip on the right side. The lens that he's uh, jerking around with is probably the 105 2.4. It's kind of a classic lens for that system. And it actually kind of tracks really well if, you know, he's a professional photographer taking pictures of celebrities and portraits of bands and stuff like that. Anyway, not to spoil the movie, but the film photographer doesn't get the girl in the end. Let that be a cautionary tale to all of us fallout okay so in season one episode three of fallout our boy goggins here is a uh, famous actor showing up for a photo shoot for vault tech and the photographer has this big ass camera on a tripod ready to shoot and also probably intimidate everybody else in the room there's even a, a couple more like cameras sort of over here in the background looks like one of them's a tlr on behalf of every decent american i just want to say thank you oh okay uh, there aren't too many cameras very similar to this one, so it's kind of blatantly obvious what it is. It's definitely the Mamiya RB67. The RB67 is a pretty popular nowadays uh, film camera. It's modular and it shoots uh, 6x7 images on 120 film, otherwise known as medium format film. The RB is actually a really popular studio camera from the day, so it makes sense that it's being used here. So yeah, maybe a little bit of an oversight here, but if he's shooting photos at that absolutely insane rate, he's going to go through a roll of film in like... 30 seconds. Like I said, this camera shoots six by seven, which gives you 10 frames. There was back in the day, this thing called the 220 film, which just doubled the amount. So he would have had 20 frames, but I don't know, this guy is still cranking this shit out really fast. And we never see him or his likely miserable assistant ever reload the back of the camera. I'm not really super sure why he has one hand on the barrel of the lens like he does here. There isn't any focusing mechanism inside these lenses as far as I'm aware. You actually focus the RB67 by turning these little knobs down near the uh, shutter button on the body of the camera that push or pull the lens away from the film plane with a bellows system, sort of like a large format lens. So the actual focus on this camera is located down here. You can actually kind of see it to give some credit to this guy who's probably an actor. The lever cranking action and the location of the shutter button is accurate. Thank you very much. Oh, this, uh, thank you. This suit is tight. This thing really block radiation? Um, hmm. I don't think that's the right shutter sound. This is what the successor to the RB67 sounds like. So that's the RZ67, kind of a similar camera, but with more electronic technology built in. Whereas the RB67, the one in the in Fallout, is a little bit more mechanical and is kind of thus lusted after a little bit more in some circles nowadays. It's possible that the shutter noise is kind of being covered up by this like flash sound effect, which just sounds like some typical Hollywood stock bullshit sound effect that is spammed way too much in the movies. Hey, thank you. I've never heard of a flash that actually sounds like that but I'm not really the guy to ask. It's usually a popping or like a bursting noise, I think, right? As for the lens, I can't really tell. It looks like it's either the Mamiya Secor 65 millimeter, I think it's a F4 or, it's either that or the 127 millimeter 3.8, I think it was. Maybe it's neither. I don't fucking know. One hour photo. No one ever takes a photograph something they want to forget okay so in this movie robin williams plays a creepy ass drugstore photo department guy and makes you uncomfortable to watch for like an hour and a half so that's fun for no one i'll take care of mrs yorkin what have we got today two rolls and i think i've got one in here as well like a mini looks it's a very nice camera okay so yeah as he says in the movie that's the like a mini looks but if you want to get really technical it's actually the Leica Mini Lux Zoom. There is actually a difference. And yeah, you wouldn't believe how much fun I am at parties. In all fairness, the Leica Mini Lux is a very, very similar camera. It's just got a fixed 40 millimeter f2.4 on it that is godly. And it comes with flex cable issues 
out the ass and back around. The Minilux zoom that's actually in this movie comes with a 35 to 70 millimeter lens that is nowhere near as fast as the 2.4 on the Minilux, but it's Leica, it's likely pretty good. The Leica Minilux zoom in this movie is the black version, which is much less common to find nowadays. These Minilux cameras were definitely, you know, top of the line back in the day, and they still are to some degree. That's why they go for such a premium price tag. It's a very nice camera. Really? Mm. Because Will's been trying to get me to go digital, and I'm... Oh, don't do that. I'd be out of a job. <laughs> well, at least they got that part right. Oh, you have one shot left. Oh, that's okay. Oh, it's a shame to waste it. Oh, no, really, it's fine. Oh, no, please. <laughs> go around. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not the right shutter sound for that camera. I've never shot it, personally, so I don't actually know, but I imagine it probably sounds a bit more like this. Oddly enough, that sound that they use in the movie sounds like it comes from a digital camera. Anyway, before we wrap this video up, I'd like to take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor, Squarespace, for their ongoing support. You've probably heard of the industry-leading Squarespace before, but did you know that it features even more modern-day tools to help you build a website in virtually no time at all? Tools like Design Intelligence, which utilize groundbreaking artificial intelligence to not only perfect, but personalize your new website down to every last detail. Are you a photographer like me looking to sell prints of your photographic work? Great. You can now use AI to power things like product and video descriptions, as well as email campaigns. It designs to take some of the load off when crafting your new website workspace to allocate other resources like time and critical thinking to other more important components of your online presence. And on the topic of selling products, Squarespace even features preset payment infrastructures to start the inflow of economy to you in exchange for goods or services. If you've ever dreamed of making profit from your photography through print sales, photo books, etc., Squarespace has you covered with payment methods such as Klarna, Direct Debit, Apple Pay, Afterpay, and even ClearPay. So what are you waiting for? If you're ready to build a website, you can start a free trial today at Squarespace dot com slash grainy days and if you use the code grainy days at checkout you can get 10 percent off your first purchase that's that uh feel free to leave a comment and recommend more movies with film cameras in them if you'd like to see another one of these i'll disregard them but you can leave one anyway i hope you're having a good day though realistically how good can it be if you're stuck watching youtube videos about people using film cameras and movies wrong